Knowing the names and basic features of each external button will really help us to understand how to tame our camera. It will also make it much easier in future lessons to know which button I'm talking about when I'm showing you more complex tutorials. Let's take a quick overview of the external buttons and ports. This is the shutter button. It is a two-phase button, meaning that the button has two different positions. The first is a halfway depression, which will activate focusing, and the second is a full depression, which will actually take the picture. I want you to train your finger to feel the difference between the first depression, it's a very soft, spongy resistance, versus the second position, which is pushing it down all the way until it takes a picture. Very important to know the difference in feeling with your index finger between these two positions until it becomes second nature. Just in front of the shutter button, as well as immediately next to where your right thumb would rest, we have rotating dials. They move to the left and right. These two wheels will allow us to change our camera settings. The front wheel, which I sometimes call the primary control wheel, controls our aperture. The back wheel, which I sometimes call the secondary control wheel, controls our shutter speed. We will be spending a lot of time talking about these in the exposure control lessons, but they are also used to change many other settings. On the top left of the camera, we have a round dial with four buttons. When we press one of these buttons and rotate the secondary selector, we can change certain camera settings as displayed on our top LCD or our back monitor. Some of these settings can be further adjusted with the primary selector. The bottom button selects our shooting mode, whether it's P, S, A, or M. Left is white balance, top is image quality, such as RAW or JPEG, and the right is our metering mode. At the base of this controller, we have a rotating dial that can be unlocked by first pressing down the post just in front of it. This dial controls the release modes, which is what the camera will do after we push the shutter button down all the way. It can be a single shot, burst, timer, quiet shot, things of that nature. Behind the shutter button is the ISO button, which allows us to change the sensitivity of our sensor to light. You are going to be using this a lot. Press and hold it down, and then rotate your secondary controller to change your ISO setting. You are going to be using these first buttons and controllers very often. Let's take a look at some of the other secondary camera buttons so you know what they are and what they do. The power switch rotates around the shutter button. And you will notice that if you rotate it further clockwise, it will activate an LCD and button light. Just behind and to the left of it is the video record button, which you will press every time you want to start and stop video recording. To the right of the ISO button, we have the exposure compensation button, which we will talk about in depth a little later. As you grip the camera next to where your right middle finger would rest, we have the PV button or depth of field preview. This closes down the lens aperture blades to allow us to see the depth of field in real time. Below that, we have the FN1 button, which can be customized in many ways, and I'll show you how to do that in the deep menu section. Out of the box, it'll control your crop mode. On the opposite side of the camera, we have the lens release lock, which we have to press every time we want to remove a lens. Below the lens release, we have the auto focus mode in the focus cluster square selector. When we press this button and rotate our primary controller, we can change our focusing clusters. When we rotate the secondary selector when holding this down, we can change which focus mode we are using. I'll have a full lesson on this later on in the course. The switch allows us to quickly jump to manual and back to autofocus when needed. Above the lens release, we have the bracketing button. Hold this down and rotate your secondary selector to activate it. Bracketing allows the camera to change different settings between each shot. On the back of the camera, we have the play button, which allows us to see the images we have taken. The button with the garbage can icon allows us to delete certain images. On the far left, we have six buttons. The first is the deep menu. We will be spending a significant amount of time going into this in my recommended settings in that lesson. It's about an hour of information, so much to cover. The next button is the protect button which allows us to assign an icon to our image during playback that would prevent us from accidentally deleting it. You will also notice it has a question mark next to it, and this has to do with the deep menu. If you see an item in the menu with a question mark icon next to it, it means that you can push this button and it'll give you a brief description of what it is you're seeing. The third button down is the magnify button, and below that is the zoom out button. 
In all honesty, I don't see myself using these that much because of our touchscreen, which is very fast to zoom in and out in a similar way that we would use a smartphone. The checkered box means that if we keep on pressing this, we will continue to zoom out and get a thumbnail view of our images. The flash icon means that when we press and hold this button down, we can change our flash exposure compensation when rotating the primary selector. However, we need a flash in order for this to work. Next, we have the OK button, which is like an enter button on a computer. And below that, we have the FN2 button, which can also be customized in many ways that I will discuss later. To the right of the monitor, we have a directional pad with a lock switch around it. If this lock is turned to L, which can sometimes accidentally happen, you will not be able to move your focusing squares around. The directional pad, which I also call the multi-selector, helps us navigate menus and certain controls. Pressing the center button is like another enter button. The directional pad can be used to move our focusing squares, but the much better tool for the job is the joystick, which is ergonomically perfect for changing focusing squares in the viewfinder, and we'll talk about this in depth a little later. On the bottom right of the camera, we have the live view video mode selector, as well as the LV button. Pressing the LV button will put us into live view so we can see what we are shooting in real time on the monitor. The selector dial will help us choose whether we want a still or a video mode when shooting in live view. Something you will notice is that the video mode gives us an exposure preview, while the still live view mode does not by default. However, we can toggle exposure preview in the stills live view mode by pressing the OK button. Below the directional pad, we have an info button, which allows us to show certain shooting or playback information when we have pressed this. The I button to me means change information, and it allows us to access even more secondary controls and settings in the shooting modes, as well as live view. It is particularly helpful in the video shooting mode when we can access things like audio. Above the joystick, we have the AF on button, which is used in back button focusing. I'll get into greater detail on this in our focusing lesson. Just to the right of the viewfinder, we have the diopter adjustment, which allows us to change the focus of the viewfinder if we are wearing corrective lenses. You will need to gently pull this wheel out from the camera body before rotating it and then pushing it into the camera body to lock it into position. To the left of the viewfinder, we have the viewfinder shutter, which we can close if we want to prevent light from entering the camera from the viewfinder and affecting the exposure, which can sometimes happen. Underneath the right grip, we have the memory card access, both for the XQD and SD memory card slots. On the left side of the camera, under the rubber gaskets, we have several ports, including the USB port, the headphone and microphone input, as well as the HDMI out. Under the front ports, we have our flash sync terminal and our 10 pin remote terminal. Beneath the right grip, we also have a battery port, which allows us to swap out batteries. To release a battery, slide the orange lever towards the body. And of course, we have this awesome tilting monitor. Something you should know is that as of this recording, the touch screen is active when reviewing images and you cannot change your exposure settings using it. Something else you will notice is that the garbage button and the ISO button have a red format logo. If you press and hold both of these down at the same time, and hold them down, this will activate the format card option, which is easiest to navigate on your back LCD monitor. It allows you to program a clean wipe of your memory cards. The green dot buttons, which are quality and exposure compensation, when pressed and held down for two seconds, will reset your camera back to factory settings. So that's an overview of the camera. We've gone over all the buttons and have briefly covered what they do. I promise you that if you practice, the day will come that you will feel you have complete control over your camera and it feels really good to know how to do everything. For the rest of the course, we will go through each of these settings individually so you know what they are, what they do, as well as how to change them and apply them to your shooting. There may come a time when you forget which button does what, just come on back and we'll go over it again. If you found this video helpful, you might be interested in my new crash course on the Nikon D500. I'll teach you the basics and show you how to shoot like a pro in no time. You can order it from the following link.